five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Space Business Podcast, where we investigate all the exciting ways in which people participate in the new space economy by conversations with entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and other members of the space family. I'm Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor in and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I am an alumnus of the International Space University, which is also our partner in the podcast. Here's a short message from them. The International Space University, founded in 1987 in Massachusetts, USA, and now headquartered in Strasbourg, France, is the world's premier international space education institution. It is supported by major space agencies and aerospace organizations. ISU offers the Master of Science in Space Studies program at its central campus in Strasbourg. ISU also conducts the highly acclaimed two months space studies program at different host institutions in locations spanning the globe. And more recently implemented the Executive Space Course, the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies program, and Commercial Space program. ISU programs are delivered by over 100 ISU faculty members in concert with invited industry and agency experts from institutions around the world. Since its founding, 33 years ago, more than 4,800 students and participants from over 100 countries graduated from ISU. Follow us on social media at ISUNet. My guest on this episode is Stefan Powell, the CTO and the co-founder of Dawn Aerospace. Dawn essentially wants to provide the transportation services that the new space economy will need. That includes satellite propulsion, but Wait for it, it also includes space planes. Yes, vehicles that take off and land like airplanes, but go to space. As an additional bonus, we continue on our quest to hear from space startups based all around the world. Dawn is based in Christchurch, New Zealand. Now somewhere between space planes and New Zealand, hopefully I got your attention. So please enjoy my conversation with Stefan. Hi everybody, today I'm here with uh, Stefan Powell from on aerospace. Welcome, Stefan. How are you doing? Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm doing well, thanks. This is actually the second attempt we were trying to do this last week when I was uh, traveling in Brazil and the internet unfortunately didn't work very well. It's just another proof that we need to Starlink around the world. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. The first... <laughs> More connectivity as, as noted... is always going to be more better. Yes. <laughs> as I noted in our conversation, the beginning of our conversation last week, this is going to be the longest distance uh, virtual podcast interview yet. I'm in Zurich. You guys are in Christchurch, New Zealand, which we're going to definitely talk about the, the Kiwi, the New Zealand space ecosystem. I think you guys are about 18,000 kilometers distance. I don't think there's even a direct flight from here. I think I can fly indirectly to Australia. That takes about 24 hours. And then I connect another few hours to New Zealand. Although if we had some sort of plane or space plane that could fly at Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, you could get there in a few hours. And I wonder why I mentioned a Mach 3 space plane. But anyway, we'll get to that. Stefan, do you want to give us the elevator pitch on what Dawn Aerospace is doing, please? Yeah, sure. Dawn Aerospace is a space transportation company, first and foremost. So, you know, why, why space? Well, space is about a half trillion dollar industry, which kind of sounds like a lot, but it's not really. You know, it pales in comparison to many other industries. But we want to get into space because we can see that a lot of these Fortune 500 companies are actually looking to get into space technology very, very soon. You know, that, that some of them are already using a lot of space technology like, you know, Earth observation or comms stuff. You know, that's all the stuff we can see that's happening in the next five years. And they seem to be pretty sizable industries in their own right. But the, the thing that's going to cause space to become a, a multi-trillion dollar industry is what's actually coming after that. And that's you know, manufacturing in space. That's super drugs and chip manufacturing and near Earth orbit becoming a gateway to the to the rest of the solar system as we build moon bases and Mars bases and all this stuff, there's, there's going to be a massive need for space transportation. And so Dawn Aerospace is all about making space transportation that's truly sustainable and scalable to these needs. Because the, the way that we're currently doing it, hydrazine for in-space propulsion and rockets that are at best marginally reusable, it just doesn't cut it. It's, it's never going to be good enough to make these new industries actually flourish. It's, it's just insufficient. So Dawn Aerospace is all about 
building the technology that we're going to need in 10, 20 years' time. And I think usually I would start kind of talking about the company specifically, and then sometimes with some of the founders who have a, a larger vision of what space might look like, we would go into those more general details. Um, and but did you have already alluded to basically the larger space economy? And, and actually, I've you know read some of the things on your websites, and you're talking about the circular space economy. And I think it's a really fascinating vision. So could you elaborate just a little bit more on that? I mean, you already mentioned a few examples, but in sort of what do you expect might happen here in what sort of time frame? In, in terms of the new space industries, to be honest, it's super hard to know. I mean, there's a bunch of nameable stuff, you know, um, like I said, in space manufacturing, that's super materials from, grown from single crystals in space or super drugs that, you know, ibuprofen, that's a thousand times stronger because it can be grown in space in, in super pure environments. Semiconductor manufacturing is another absolute sitter for in space manufacturing. I mean, there's, you know, essentially uh, abundant energy, no gravity to stop things flying everywhere, infinite real estate and a perfectly clean environment to be able to manufacture this stuff. Then there's a few more sort of far out there, things like asteroid mining or, or moon bases and, and that sort of thing. But actually the thing we think is, is really going to happen is, is there's going to be a whole lot of industries that we don't anticipate, that space is very much at this sort of you know, dial-up stage of the internet where you know, in the early 90s it, was, it just wasn't really foreseeable what people were going to make a whole lot of money out of what they were going to do with the internet in 30 years' time. And it's, we think it's actually basically unpredictable. But what is predictable is the fact that they will need to get stuff from Earth up into space. The things in space will need some sort of way of being transported around, and they will need a method of getting stuff back down to Earth. So that's not just product from, from factories in space, but it's also a way of cleaning up space, you know, to get rid of space debris, to be able to make this a circular economy, you know, like a two-way destination. Otherwise, it's kind of like the internet where you have really great upload speed, but no download speed. You know, what's the use of that? And a lot of the things uh, that you mentioned, like certainly I would agree with, I often compare the current state of the space industry to the internet in, I don't know, maybe 95 or 96, when we're starting to see the potential of the internet. But if you think back to 95, 96, a lot of the really big companies we now identify the internet with, like Facebook or Uber or Airbnb or even Tinder, they hadn't even been invented yet. And all of that is still to come. And I suppose what you guys are doing with the transport capability, just like arguably SpaceX or Blue Origin is you're building the equivalent of the global fiber networks on which the internet can run. Is that a fair thing to say? Absolutely. It's, it's infrastructure. That's exactly what it is. It's the key tool that you need. And, you know, without that, there, there simply isn't a space economy. And what we have at the moment just barely works. You know, it's, you know, rockets are kind of like one of the worst vehicles that we've ever devised. Okay. They do, they do work to some extent, but man, it's difficult. They're horrendously dangerous and the, you know, <laughs> kind of unreliable, really. They're, they're really hamstringing the whole industry. But if we can revolutionize that core infrastructure there, the things we'll be able to do are quite literally unimaginable. Let's delve into that. Because, I mean, of course, uh, I mentioned SpaceX and Blue Origin, and they're very much still using the same type of like you know, liquid chemical rockets that we've been using basically for many, many decades. It sounds like you guys think that there, there could be better ways of, of doing this. So let's expand on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like they're all slightly different flavors of, you know, pointy end at the top, fiery bit at the bottom type rockets, you know. But those companies generally have good reason for doing what they're doing. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to call out SpaceX and say, oh, what idiots, they should be doing it our way. Their mission is to go to Mars and there's no runways and there's not much air on Mars. So, you know, a space plane is not going to work for them. But I think our goal is just quite different to some of these other companies that we're looking much further out that, we're not looking to supply a market that's coming in the next five years where the market's maybe twice as big as it is now. We're looking further down the track to, you know, 20 years time where it, it could be 10 times as large, you know, where, where we actually need, you know, same day reusability and, you know, flights to space from multiple cities, multiple times a day that, the you know, you, you just need a whole new scale of space access. So you have to think about how you, how would you achieve that in a completely different way? And that's so much more than just the hardware. You know, getting to space is kind of three major parts. It's kind of the hardware itself, which is, you know, the rocket. I'm sure that's important. It's the regulation that you fly under. So, you know, what set of rules are you actually allowed to operate under? And it's the infrastructure. So, you know, in most rockets' case, it's sort of Kennedy Space Center type spaceports. Current rockets are really limited in how well they scale in terms of the hardware, just because you're throwing them away so often. You know, you're sure that's great if you get five reuses out of one, but um, you know, still, if you want to do a thousand flights, you're still 
need a rocket factory to keep pumping out rockets in. In the end, um, you're left with a few things in space and a whole bunch of scrap. In terms of the regulation, even if you just magically had a thousand rockets, it would take you many, many years to actually launch them just because the, the regulation isn't set up to be scalable. And then the infrastructure itself, you know, the, the launch bases, a typical launch base does less than a launch a week at best, you know, and, and that's pretty good, actually. So, yeah, once again, launching those thousands of rockets means you're going to need tens or hundreds of, of launch bases to do so. And so it's just it's just fundamentally not a particularly scalable way of getting to space. So we had to think about it differently. Thankfully, there is hardware and a rule set in an, in an infrastructure base that does produce a highly scalable concept, and that's the airline industry. So we want to piggyback on the airline industry, essentially. We, we want to take an aircraft and hold true all the things that make the vehicle an aircraft, but give it the performance of a rocket. And that's, that's actually very doable. So an aircraft, of course, I suppose what you're alluding to here is the fact that, you know, an aircraft could fly many times a day. I mean, even frankly, if it's one of those intercontinental aircraft I mentioned that I take to Australia, then it would typically fly, I don't know, from Zurich to Sydney, and then it would stand there for like a few hours. Maybe it would even get maintained a little bit, but then it would fly immediately back. I guess this is what you're saying, that we have a turnaround of 30 minutes at the low end and maybe like a day at the high end. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're talking about if you can turn it around in sort of six hours, that's pretty good. It's At least that's a lot better than the current standard. I think the current record, at least for an orbital vehicle, is something like 50-something days. And I think the record for a suborbital vehicle is about two weeks. So same day is definitely an order of magnitude better than, than anything that's gone before. Yeah, I'm going to assume the 50-day vehicle is probably SpaceX on the, the Falcon 9. Yeah, I think they just recently bit the space shuttle. I think the space shuttle yeah. was like 56 or something, and they did it in 53. And the space shuttle is an interesting one, right? Because, I mean, that's, well, that's not a plane. At least you had, I suppose, it, was, it, it started like a rocket with its stack. It landed like a plane. And many people may not know this, but in the original concept, the turnaround was supposed to be really quick. Then, unfortunately, if I remember correctly, what happened is they had to actually end up taking apart the engines and very highly complex engines after each flight, and they had to check out their heat shield after each flight. So unfortunately, they, they never achieved the quick turnaround that they were targeting. Yeah, exactly. And never achieved any you know, reasonable price because of it. And um, that was essentially because, you know, although it looked like an aircraft in the sense that it had landing gear and wings, there was nothing else about it that was aircraft-like at all. Yeah. So it, okay, it didn't so operate like one at all. <laughs> let's, so the, the space shuttle was initially proposed, I think, while we were landing on the moon in the late 60s and then finally approved in the early 70s. And then the program was developed in the early 70s and flew for the first time in, in 81. So we're now like 40, 50 years on for that. So why don't you tell us like, you know, what we can do now that we weren't able to do back then and what this would actually look like in terms of having a, a space plane? So in terms of the technology, for sure, like, you know, technology has advanced massively, you know, uh, everything from composite structures to, to 3D printed engines, um, you know, just even basic components being way more commonly available that you can just go buy valves if you need valves or you know simple stuff like that or differential gps you know that was a 140 million dollar development project in the 90s for the x34 and i can go buy a differential gps for a thousand bucks now you know like stuff like that is, is just light years ahead now I, I think the single biggest change is the scale at which we're working at you know while the space plane is not really restricted to the small satellite market the fact that the small satellite market now exists means that we can build a viable product at quite literally 1,000th the size. You know, the space shuttle was designed to take about 20-ish ton into orbit. If we could build a space plane that could take 20 kilograms into orbit, there would be a market for that. So that massively reduces the scale of the problem. It makes it so much more, you know, just such a lower barrier to entry that this is actually a realistic thing for a private company to go out and raise money and develop this technology and enter into a market that can then support it. And from there, you can scale it up and up and up to to larger scales where things become more efficient to, to where you really have, you know, something you could put humans on as well and that you could start doing point-to-point -point transport. And, but you've got a, um, a technology development tree that's actually viable now, starting with venture capital. So when you're starting with a basically, as you mentioned, small satellite, uh, non-human, uncrewed capability, there is, of course, as we all know, there's a lot of traditional rocket launch startups trying to do that. So the, the, the guys using chemical rockets with, with the pointy end up and the fiery end down. And of course, you're also, I guess, competing with SpaceX, which now in the Starlink launches, and we just had one a few days ago, they seem to be taking up third-party satellites as, as part of the rideshare program all of the time. Where do you guys 
see yourselves fitting in there alongside the others and alongside SpaceX? In terms of like cost to orbit, we should definitely be significantly lower. But you know, uh, us we're reasonably far away from actually having an orbital product, and we're not we're not running to that goal as fast as possible because we don't really feel like we're competing with the rest because we're going for a technology that's fundamentally one step ahead. It's we're just not competing with them on the, in that same race. We're competing for the space economy in the next ten or fifteen years. In the meantime, we will have a pretty viable suborbital product. We'll be very competitive there. And so we'll be able to, you know, earn some revenue and prove the technology out in that sphere. And in the meantime, I really hope all of these companies, Blue Origin, SpaceX, Rocket Labs, Fireflies, Relativities, I hope they're all successful because what we really want is a vibrant space economy. You know, that's the fuel to this whole fire. That's what, that's the reason to get into the space industry. That's the reason to build the next generation technology to build on top of what all of these other companies are already doing. We're not really competitive in my mind at all. So let's talk about your your suborbital capability. I think that's correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's the thing you just announced, the the Mark II space plane, and what would that look like? Yeah, so so the Mark II space plane is a subscale vehicle for what our eventual orbital technology will be. So it'll fly exactly the same trajectory as what the first stage of our orbital technology. It's essentially the same sort of profile as what you'd expect the first stage of a classic two stage rocket to fly. So you know it takes off, albeit horizontally like an aircraft. It'll fly up to around about 100 or so kilometers altitude, and then it'll be able to re-enter the atmosphere, turn around and glide back to the launch base where it'll land, back to the airport actually. So then the, the next generation version of that does exactly the same flight profile, exactly the same accelerations and dynamic pressures and you know heating and all of that, except it will, at the top of its trajectory, it'll release uh, a second stage, which will be able to fly off into, uh, into orbit and deliver a satellite. The first generation of this, the Mark II, will be able to take about a four kilogram payload on that uh, first stage trajectory. So four kilogram payload, so just just for people who may not be familiar with this, this is sort of a, a size of a small CubeSat, basically. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of modeled on a 3U CubeSat, not because people will be using this to launch a 3U CubeSat into space because it's not going to orbit, you know, it's just going on a suborbital trajectory. But one of the really cool uses for flying these suborbital flights is actually technology demonstration and people being able to you know mature their technology really quickly you know they can chuck their satellite in in the suborbital vehicle it'll fly up really high and really fast and they'll be able to check out all of their communication systems and just generally mature the whole design so that when they actually put it up into space they'll be confident that it works because you know unlike uh, in space where you on orbit where you don't get a second chance with the suborbital flight, it's coming right back to you. And if something bad happened, you know, if something vibrated off or if something in your comms protocol wasn't working, you can fix it and just go fly again. And the cost is very doable. And the turnaround time is, you know, same day. What kind of cost are we talking about here, you guys think, for one suborbital flight? That's about 50,000 US and we're advertising that on our website. And that actually comes down significantly if you want to buy multiple flights. You can go as low as about 20,000 US. Understood. And then, so the space plane, let's just flesh that out a little bit more. It would start from a regular airport. Would it use a rocket motor? Like, is, is that yeah, still like yeah. a fire, fiery ant? Okay. Would you be allowed to operate from like sort of any airport or you would need like special authorization because of the, the rocket element? I mean, you're probably not going to fly it out of like LAX or Heathrow or something, yeah. but it flies out of a pretty normal airport. You know, we've got understandings with several just regular airports around New Zealand, one in Omaru and one in Pukaki that we can fly out of those airports, you know, that the aircraft will integrate with other airspace users. We don't have to kick everyone off. For early flights where we're testing the aircraft, just like any other aircraft gets tested, yes, we do shut down some airspace to be able to do the first flights. But once we're in commercial operation, we'll be flying with other airspace users around as well. And then so your platform, I'm trying to recall now who else is offering suborbital platforms. But I mean, in terms of Leaving aside what's what's called sounding rockets, the best known one is is probably Virgin Galactic with its uh, Spaceship Two, which is supposed to take humans and space tourists, but could also take um, experiments and cargo. So this is a very different architecture, right? Because I mean, obviously with Virgin Galactic, you have this big carrier plane releasing f- effectively a rocket, whereas you guys basically it's just one vehicle. It goes up, it comes down. Yeah, exactly. And you know, once again, um, Virgin Galactic's thing it's probably getting a lot closer to being an aircraft than the space shuttle, but it's still kind of missing a bunch of the fundamental things. 
you know, it's it's a hybrid rocket, so you, you can't just put gas in it and go fly it again. It has this, you know, other sort of zero stage, I suppose, you know, this carrier aircraft that has to, it has to be mated to. It's a complicated affair to actually go fly that aircraft. It's not just like, you know, jumping in your car and turning the key and going. But, you know, the, the aircraft that we're building is very much an aircraft in every way, just how you and I understand an aircraft if we go and fly, you know, with whatever airline, you know, you, you show up, they're putting gas in the plane, they do a bunch of maintenance checks, and once everyone's on board and there's, and there's gas in there, they'll take off and they can turn it around and get uh, again in three hours once they've landed. So, um, yeah, it's the vehicles we're designing are first and foremost aircraft, and the rocket is only there to, to give it the extra performance that it needs. And what's the development timeline on, on the Mark II and then on the, on the further the Mark III orbital version? Like, when do you think we could see this flying? Yeah, so, so we'll be flying the first, uh, the Mark II A, we're calling it. It's actually a jet engine powered version. We'll be flying that in the next few months. We'll iteratively test that vehicle. So, you know, every time we go out flying, we'll fly a little bit higher and a little bit faster and we'll prove out the airframe and refine all our aerodynamics models and everything. And then in about nine months time or so, we'll put uh, rocket motors on that and we'll start flying high energy trajectories. So we'll start flying above the atmosphere. So well above 30 kilometers altitude. We'll start testing out all of the, the non-aerodynamic flight features like reaction control systems and ability to re-enter. And then within sort of 18 months' time, we expect that we'll be able to fly up to space, actually. And then that will be the first vehicle ever to be able to fly to space twice in a day. And so you mentioned the jet engine motors, but I understood that you're purely using jet engine motors as a, on, on the first demonstrators, like you're saying, to test the airframe. The ultimate vehicle, will, will it just have rocket motors or will there be some sort of hybrid? system yeah just rocket motors so i mean jet engines are essentially they're just too heavy they just don't have the power to weight ratio to really make any sense yeah and of course typically the way rockets are going to space is that uh, you know since ever since we started doing this we've been staging our rockets at at these two stages like like a falcon 9 is there anything special you had to do in the design of the rocket motors like now that you use one rocket motor to go all the way from earth's surface you know through various atmospheric pressures all the way to space well, the performance that we need is about the same as the first stage. The vehicle we're designing is really just a reusable first stage. The second stage is still intended to be expendable for now. And that's purely just to make, just to mean that we don't need to have anything particularly special in terms of that first stage engine. It really is just a, a pretty normal chemical rocket. The only difference being that it's it's not powered by liquid oxygen as most are. It's It's powered by hydrogen peroxide. And that's purely because liquid oxygen boils off and it's therefore not particularly convenient for an aircraft you know if your flight gets delayed 30 minutes because some other aircraft was was on the runway you can't have half your propellant boil off that that doesn't work you need a much more aircraft friendly fuel which hydrogen peroxide is it's really nothing particularly special in terms of the rocket motor and we actually don't need anything particularly special it's a little bit of a misconception that you need these really really crazy payload fractions you know sure we will burn a little bit more propellant than other vehicles would because we have wings on board and we have landing gear and all that weight does degrade your performance but in terms of the end cost it makes so much sense as long as you can reuse the vehicle as long as you can fly under aircraft rules and as long as you don't have to build your own spaceports you can just use other airports you know fuel is typically only like one percent of the total cost of a mission so you know let's for argument's sake say we actually burn twice as much fuel for the same payload as another vehicle. Well, okay, now it's not 1%, but it's 2%. But, you know, our infrastructure costs, which are normally 30%, are basically zero now because you pay a takeoff and a landing fee, which is a few thousand dollars, not a few million dollars. You know, the hardware cost is pretty well near zero because we intend to be able to fly this vehicle thousands of times. So you very quickly get to a situation where that 2% of cost that you're spending on fuel is accompanied by another 2% of all other costs and you're at only 4% of the original cost to get to space. So you've, you've reduced the whole cost by like 96% at that point. You know, you're well and truly a factor 20 better than a rocket at that point. Yeah, it's like you're saying, because of course, historically, we, for quote unquote normal rockets, we used them once, we threw them away. Elon and SpaceX came along, and then I think they just now reused the booster for the first time for, I think it was the sixth time or the seventh time? I think the sixth time. Yeah, yeah, it was and- the sixth. 
that's an amazing achievement in the history of rocket flight. But of course, what you're saying and what we should be getting to is again is this aircraft comparison where we, use, and where in fairness Elon wants to get to as well with the Starship, right? Where we just use it hundreds, maybe maybe thousands of times. But I wanted to pick up on something that that you mentioned, which is interesting, just the fact that this is a plane that has wings, right? Of course, regular rockets don't have wings again because wings are pretty useless in space, and and, and regular rockets weren't coming back anyway. The space shuttle and then uh, what's called the, I think it's the X-37, the, the US Air Force, basically secret plane, they have wings, which allow them to glide and give them something called cross range, right? That you could actually go like a few thousand miles one way or the other to different places on Earth, which I suppose, obviously, the Mark II and your later planes will also have this cross range and can go to other places. We've been talking about coming back to the same the same landing strip, but I guess in theory, you could also go somewhere else, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's actually another huge industry that people are starting to talk about it with Starship, actually like point-to-point transport, because that like that's yet another industry that is just massive compared to the space industry. These concepts, these things that we're talking about, bringing rocket-like performance to and aircraft you know, uh, architecture has perfect application to, to point-to-point transport. And yes, you certainly could travel you know, transatlantic in a matter of minutes, not hours. Do you think there's any sort of use case? I mean, your initial versions are, are cargo only and like a few a few kilogram, but could you be like the sort of like the ultra high speed FedEx for, I don't know, like something that's really time sensitive and needs to get from point A to point B? Yeah, like absolutely. And that is kind of in our far out concepts there, that all that stuff is absolutely an, op- an option once you have this technology. So we're just laser focused on actually showing that we can get rocket-like performance into something that we fly as an aircraft. So that, that's what we're holding true with every vehicle that we develop, the first and foremost aircraft, to make sure that, yeah, like this is a long-term potential thing. It has all of the fundamentals of an aircraft, which will mean that, yeah, you can do point-to-point transport and, yeah, it'll be safe, it'll be reliable, so eventually you'll be able to put humans on board as well. So, yeah, I mean, you'll be able to do high-speed transportation for whatever FedEx stuff or for people and they're huge industries. And so if I remember correctly, I mean, Star, uh, sorry, SpaceX, of course, right now is very much focused on it. Starlink communications network, but you're right, they have mentioned the point-to-point transportation in the past. And I think they've given a time frame, you know, around like maybe within the next 10 years. It, it was as usual, like Elon was saying, like a few years less, and then Gwyn Shotwell came in and said, no, no, this is going to take about 10 years. <laughs> yeah. what, what, do you guys, what do you guys think when we'll be able to fly from uh, Germany or Switzerland to Australia in 45 minutes? I don't know. I mean, that's super hard to say, right? Like, it really depends on on so many factors. If I'm honest, I think that's it's super challenging to do with something that relies on engines for landing. You know, maybe you can do point high speed point to point transport with just cargo, but that's going to be really hard to human certify for. You know, anyone other than astronauts to you know just be able to buy a two thousand dollar ticket and travel on Starship from New York to London in forty minutes. I, that's more than a decade out, in my opinion. I think it is much more doable if you have a much more classic, well-understood architecture like wings. You know, so if your engine suddenly stops, you you aren't just a you know a, a lead brick falling out of the sky. You have some way of controlling how you come back down. But even then, it's it's very challenging. I mean, certifying an aircraft is a very challenging thing in and of itself. You know, like developing the A380 was like a 20-something year development program in itself, and that was relatively established technology. So these are long-term things, you know, we've got to be chipping away at this for the next few decades. Yes, so I was going to touch, you mentioned something I was going to touch upon anyway, which is that historically large aircraft programs, you know, for, like you mentioned, the A380, they've taken many years and they've taken literally billions of dollars in development. Is that, are you guys going to face something similar or I assume you guys probably think you can do it cheaper? Yeah, I mean, we can definitely do it a bit cheaper, like I say, because we're, we don't have to start at space shuttle scale. You know, we don't have to start with an A380. We can have a very iterative development scheme. So unlike a rocket, you know, where everything has to be perfect when you go to the launch pad, because, well, even if it works, you're not getting it back. We can start small. We can start much more practical and we can start flying things. We don't have to analyze everything to death. We can be quite test heavy, which is a much more efficient way to develop and learn about technology. Because, I mean, ultimately, humanity really hasn't done very much space flight and we don't actually know that much about the domains that we're going into. So we're anticipating having to learn a lot of the stuff along the way. So all of our vehicles are, are designed to be very good test vehicles. So, you know, the, the whole reusability thing is really great to have in your end product, but it's even better to have in your development vehicles. Because if, if we can go fly every day for literally only, you know, less than 20 grand cost, we can be learning about, you know, how our vehicles actually operate learning about things like the thermal protection systems and re-entry dynamics and 
And we don't have to get these things perfect first off because we the first re-entry we do is not going to be from 150 kilometers altitude. The first one we could, could do is only from maybe 30 kilometers altitude and then 35 and then 40. And we can we can iterate towards the end goal. And that'll allow us to, to develop stuff so much quicker. That's just, I mean, iterative design is so, so much easier than first time right. Anyone will tell you that. So, so being able to change that paradigm is going to make it so much cheaper. In a way, it sounds a little bit similar to what SpaceX is doing with the Starship, right? You do this like iterative improvements. It seems like every two weeks, like some, something blows up, but every time something blows up, they learn a lot and it, it helps them to build a better thing that works better the second time around. Yeah, and that was exactly how they figured out how to land Falcon 9. You know, they actually they figured out a way that they could test this without jeopardizing the whole mission. That was kind of the key because it did take them a lot of failures to, to get it right. But, you know, if you have that room to fail, you know, if, if you have this allowance where something can go wrong and your whole business doesn't fall over, maybe you lose that vehicle or, or something. But as long as you can go build another one or you, in our case, even better, you can just go fly again because if something minor goes wrong, you should have a redundancy you can still get the vehicle back and land. Then you can try, you, you know, you can fix whatever's wrong and go fly again. Cool. So just to finish off on your space plane, just so people uh, don't say I didn't ask you some, some basic questions, which I realized now we forgot to talk about. So what kind of altitude at the top of the flight profile you guys plan on getting to? And then sort of how many minutes of microgravity would that provide you? Yeah, so we're, we're aiming for an excess of 100 kilometers. So in theory, it should be able to do a substantial amount more than that. But, you know, once again, we'll iteratively work towards that. It, it may well actually be able to greatly exceed that. About 120 kilometers altitude will give you around three minutes of microgravity, depending on when exactly uh, your opinion of microgravity starts. Some scientists get pretty picky and they, they want the really high quality stuff. And then they say, well, you're, you're only getting 60 seconds of microgravity. Yeah. And then just, just to uh, reiterate, so what's your best guess then when sort of like the first full demonstration flight for suborbital and then for for orbital? So for suborbital, we're looking at sort of 18 months time, 12 to 18 months. And then orbital will be, you know, the next generation vehicle that's going to be more like a business jet size thing. And we think that'll take us about another four or so years to develop. And if I heard it cor correctly, the orbital version would at least in the beginning have two stages or is are you targeting something like a single stage orbit in the future as well i mean once again we can kind of iterate towards single stage to orbit but no that next vehicle will definitely have a second stage which is expendable that'll be about six percent of the total hardware mass so you will lose that every time every time we get better at making these vehicles you know every time we have a we figure out a better thermal protection system we can then build more performance into the first stage and by doing so you know your payload to orbit or your second stage size shrinks so as we iterate we can become closer and closer to single stage to orbit. And the idea is that eventually, you know, if technology allows, it's certainly physically possible uh, to do single stage to orbit, but it's, it's not necessarily critical at this point. Okay, let's move on from the from the space plane because I'm I'm conscious of our time and of course you have a whole other side of the business which we should also talk about which is actually the transportation once you're in space, um, you know which is the, um, the you know, what people generally would call satellite satellite propulsion which is another interesting thing because just like rockets correct me if I'm wrong but essentially we've been doing it in exactly the same way for I think it's fair to say almost 50 years. That's totally true. It's definitely the side of the business that gets less attention from people because it's much less sexy and there's. It's also much less um, abstract in, in some ways. People kind of assume that once satellites are up there, they don't really do very much except fly around because they're already going so fast. But they do need substantial propulsion to to be able to stay where they want to be or change their orbit if need be. Or, or what's really coming is people want to fly big constellations. And so they need to make sure that these satellites are precisely positioned relative to one another. That wasn't so much a problem for the really big satellites. They all used you know, this stuff called hydrazine, which is a really great in space propulsion propellant. It's just unfortunate that it's deadly toxic. You know, a teaspoon of this stuff will kill 100 people in a warehouse type thing. It's really, really nasty. And that translates to really high cost to be able to actually fuel up these satellites. Once again, not a big problem. If your satellite's worth half a billion dollars, you'll pay the half million dollar fuel bill. But as satellites have, have shrunken in size over the last, 10 years, they've gotten down to the sort of shoebox size CubeSat. And, you know, the whole mission cost of one of these three use set CubeSats is usually less than half a million bucks. So to tell them, well, hey, you know, if you want to take this hydrazine propulsion system on board, we're, we're going to slap you with a $500,000 fuel bill as well. And they suddenly their mission costs double. That's just not really doable. They're not going to do that. 
And so the only option that they've really had is um, electric propulsion, which has scaled down quite well. That's also fine for some, but electric propulsion is very, very hungry on power and time to actually use it. You have to have that system running for months to be able to do some basic maneuvers in space. And so for a satellite that only lasts three years saying, well, you're going to lose six months of those three years to just maneuvering, just running your electric propulsion system, kind of instantly lost one sixth of the value of that whole satellite. So the end effect is these satellites kind of get a little bit marooned in space. They, they get dumped out of rideshare, rides to space and big rockets. They will get dumped out in a big clump and it takes them months to disperse and they waste a whole lot of time and a, a, like a whole lot of usefulness. So what we're doing there is essentially giving them the performance of hydrazine that the, the, the bigger brother satellites have with none of the toxicity and therefore none of the cost of that big fuel bill. So we're giving mobility back to small satellites. What, what you made there is a really interesting point. I just want to slightly rephrase it so I'm sure that people understood it. Is As you correctly mentioned, SpaceX is now offering the rideshare program, which is great for operators of small satellites because you can go to space for you know very low cost. However, they kick you out all of you somewhere, you know, at some altitude, at some place in orbit, which is probably almost definitely not the target orbit where your satellite is going to operate, which means, as you said, you then have to get to your target or orbit where you can operate, where you actually start making revenues. And this could take many months, many months during which you make no revenues. You mentioned electric propulsion, and there's a, there's a number of startups, and I hope we're going to have some on the, the podcast soon uh, as well, working on electric propulsion solutions, which are more efficient than chemical propulsion but they're much less powerful, they have much less thrust. So it, it, again, everything takes a much longer time. Now, one other alternative some people are proposing, and I suppose they're also potential customers for you, is, is the so-called space tax, right? Which is sort of like the, I think one company calls it the in-space connection flight, where you know, your satellite gets kicked out by SpaceX at, I don't know, 250 kilometer orbit somewhere, the space tug comes along, your satellite piggybacks on the space tug, and the space tug probably using chemical propulsion, maybe, maybe from the own aerospace, brings it to the target orbit. Yeah, well... Um... We are building some propulsion for some some space tug manufacturers. Actually, I can't talk too much about it, but yes, that's that's absolutely a use case for it, and it will be, and it'll actually be on orbit pretty soon with with our propulsion on board. So absolutely. And it's the innovation. So on the electric propulsion side, there's sort of various uh, levels of technological innovation, and people really trying to do things differently from how things have been done in the past. On your side. With, with the in-space propulsion, is it just the propellants that you have changed or is there some other part of the in-space propulsion system that has changed? Yeah, it's certainly more than the propellants. It's all driven by the propellants. That's kind of where it started. That's where the core of the problem was. It was also a problem just in terms of the general practicality of the system. A hydrazine system typically also requires other pressurants and regulators and several other tanks and they can't be cold started or they can but only a certain number of times. And there were other chemical solutions out there that, that solved the toxicity problem, but they come with a swath of other problems in terms of like not being able to be started quickly or, or whatever. But long story short, all of these solutions that were out there, hydrazine included, just weren't that accessible. They weren't that easy to use or easy for the customer to understand. And they're, they're very complex. And so the propellants that we chose are also very simple in their nature, that they are a self-pressurizing propellant. So you just put them in a tank, and you have a tube that comes out one side of the tank that taps off the fluid. There's no need for propellant management devices. There's, there's no need for complicated pressurants or regulators or things to go wrong. There's a few small heaters on it and a pipe that goes from the tank to the thruster. All of the intelligence in how, how the thruster deals with that, that propellant is all inside the thruster. So that's really the core of our IP, is how we achieve really good performance with such a simple system because we don't need all these regulators and all the, other, all the other stuff that just confuses the customer. So we've drastically simplified the whole system to, to make it really turnkey, really simple. So, you know, at the CubeSat scale, that means that they can literally just go online and they can just add to cart, buy the module. It has a very simple interface control document which tells them how to talk to the module. Once they can talk to the module, they can tell it, hey, I want some thrust now. And it'll turn on, it'll fire the, the rocket motor, and then and turn off again. It does all the health monitoring, all the all the propellant management, everything itself, and just gives you what you want, which is mobility. The really responsive turning on and turning off. I think it was you guys that I see like this is the video online where your thruster was basically like almost following some music in terms of turning on and turning off. We just wanted to show how responsive these thrusters were, that they can be started and stopped within about five millisecond command. And so we, we demonstrated that by having them play um, 
the blower Danube, the, <laughs> that waltz. Yeah, it's good fun, actually. How did you get to decide the music? Why not, uh, I don't know, We Will Rock You or something like that? I think it just has like a really like characteristic like beats to it. And everyone knows it. And I think there's there's no like copyright claims on it or something. You know, you can actually put the Blower Danube waltz on YouTube and not get a copyright claim against you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in the end, um, uh, how much, let's say I'm a small set operator. I have some small set, I don't know, 100, 100 kilogram small set operating in lower of orbit. Do you already know roughly how much your propulsion system would cost me? Yeah, so, I mean, once again, you can go online. We're, we're super open. We're super transparent about this stuff. These things are supposed to be pretty simple systems for, for you to go buy and put together. Um, the thruster costs you around 30,000 US. The tankage and stuff is usually somewhat more specific to your mission requirements, you know, how much how much you need. But it typically, the whole system included is usually less than 100K. And that's, if I remember my other conversations correctly, that's pretty cheap because i mean i'm just thinking of you know i again i probably know the electric propulsion world a little bit better but there's quite a few electric propulsion systems which would run you north of 100 sometimes north of two hundred thousand dollars. yeah so i mean the cost does dramatically go up if you need custom solutions and if you need stuff you know packed into really tight spaces so so we've definitely put some stuff together for other customers that's significantly more than that and that's purely because of the non-recurring engineering But, you know, I'm saying it's around 100K if you're going to order that more than 10 or 20 times. If that's in, into serial production things, you know, the, the cost comes way down. The cost of actually producing this stuff is, is not that horrendous. It's really just in the engineering. And when, uh, same question as before on the space plane, what's the timeline here? When do you expect your, your satellite propulsion systems to fly in orbit? Or have they already? They should have. <laughs> they were actually, the first one was scheduled to launch September last year on the, the next Vega flight, but that's been delayed horrendously so many times for every reason under the sun including COVID. that one's scheduled to launch i think early september now we'll have another launch uh, i believe in october or november and then there's another customer launching another one uh, i believe in december so we should have three separate systems on board before christmas and one of those actually features six of our thrusters so we'd have yeah i guess eight products on orbit by christmas so that's so this is um, actually, yeah that, that's at the so cubesat scale and at the larger 20 newton thruster scale so this is actually on operational customer satellites. This is not on some testing platform. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. The customers, I mean, they're paying us for it. That that whole side of the business, the in-space propulsion stuff, is is a running business, essentially. Business unit within Dawn Aerospace, and, and that earns money. That's essentially profitable, and we're able to sink that profit into a future R&D. And that gets kind of at my next question. I guess it's a good thing you have to sort of like, you know, running sort of business unit, which makes revenues today, because of course, the other side of the business, the space plane, as you said, uh, the, the ultimate vision of that is a few years out, you know, with, a, with an orbital, fully reusable space plane. In terms of financing your venture, you know, because I was going to ask you when you said in the context of the space plane, well, it's like one step ahead of everybody else and it's the grand vision for the space economy. I mean, I love that kind of stuff. But of course, let's be honest, for a traditional sort of venture capitalist, um, they can get kind of nervous because they think, oh, well, that's sounds like it's very long term and maybe it's going to take 20 years or so. How have your conversations gone with financing providers and how have you financed, how are you financing the company? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, if you're talking about anything like 10 or 15 years out, it immediately sounds way too sci-fi for, for most business cases. But we plan to make a lot of revenue along the way. Like, uh, ultimately, those conversations don't go well. If you say, well, we're not going to make any money for 15 years, they very quickly turn off because it's just too far out. But yeah, I, I mean, the space plane, for example, the Mark II is definitely a, uh, it's a technology demonstrator for us, but it will be the most capable suborbital research vehicle ever devised. So it also makes sense for us to open that up to the scientific community of the world. You know, just like the the internet revolution for space launch, this would be kind of the like going from dial up to broadband for the, the suborbital world as well, and opens up whole new avenues of what you can do with suborbital research and That's in microgravity research or hypersonics or high altitude atmospherics. Um, there's so many topics there that are genuinely quite valuable as well. You know, they're not trillion dollar industries, but they're certainly enough to for us to be able to build a fleet of Mark II Auroras and operate daily flights. It's sort of you know somewhere between 20 and 50k a pop, a pop. That would be quite a significant revenue earner as well. So long term, we intend to continue doing this. We intend to make revenue along the whole way. And the rest is venture capital based that allows us to accelerate and move faster. We think there's certainly significant enough appetite out there. The dream is big enough, but we're practical enough to do real things along the way that we're not. We don't have to shoot for that 
that end goal right at the start. We have a very well thought out methodical way of developing the technology that allows us to, to access these key markets along the way. So right now the company is, is financed by angel money, venture capital money or government grants or? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, um, we did uh, our last raise in that was finished up around end of uh, 2018. And we've since also had many grants from the European Commission, from ESA, from the New Zealand Space Agency, from Callahan Innovation, which is a New Zealand government innovation research. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of the above, really, not to mention also sales to customers for in-space propulsion. Which is which is the best way of financing, of course. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, and I'm saying this as a venture capitalist. We certainly love to see you being able to finance at least part of your activity out of out of your own cash flows. You mentioned New Zealand there, and of course, um, your company is is based in New Zealand. Um, you guys are in Christchurch, um, although I think you have a facility in Holland as well. Now that's very interesting. Tell us a little bit about the New Zealand space ecosystem. Of course, I think most people will immediately think of um, a small company called Rocket Lab, which is probably not even that far away from you guys. But what else is going on? Obviously, Rocket Lab is the the poster child of New Zealand space, and, and rightfully so. They're doing amazing, and in many ways, they're, they're blazing a trail for us. You know, like we, you know, when we're raising money in the states, um, and they say, "What you want to do space technology from New Zealand? Like, really? Why would anyone do that?" And you can turn around and say, "Well, actually." New Zealand happens to host basically the only company that's been successful at doing it in the small in the small satellite industry. <laughs> yeah, that's been immensely helpful. Other than that, there, there are definitely some other startups around that, that not too many people know of. Everything from other companies doing in-space propulsion stuff to other ones doing um, like satellite tracking and, and stuff with, with ground-based radars to uh, all kinds of companies developing data products from space-based data. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a vibrant community. And then outside of that, outside of space directly, there's an even larger aerospace community, particularly because our regulation in New Zealand is very well suited to doing new and experimental stuff. And that's one of the key reasons that we are located in New Zealand is because the Civil Aviation Authority, our equivalent of the FAA, allows you to do very innovative stuff because they don't tell you exactly what you have to do. You know, they don't tell you exactly how your jet engine has to look to be safe because, you know, we don't even have a jet engine. So how could we possibly operate under those rules? They just say, well, you have to prove that your vehicle is as safe as other aircraft that are already operating. And so we're free to prove that however we like. It's the difference between a prescriptive rule structure. There's lots of US companies actually coming to New Zealand specifically to develop experimental aircraft under this rule set. Yeah. And I think if I remember correctly, your uh, Don Aerospace is up for some innovation award today, actually, in New Zealand. So good luck with that. Yeah, thanks. And Stefan, I heard you guys actually recently ran a competition for the Mark II for, for the, uh, the painting, the eventual painting on it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we decided we, well, you know, kind of along the themes of trying to make space more accessible, you know, while we don't have orbital access yet, something we, that we can do for people is open up some of the design. And, you know, we're mostly good engineers, but there's not too many of us at Dawn that are actually good graphic design artists. So we thought we could actually just get the, the community's input on that. So yeah, we set up this competition and it was really cool because we got like 50 or so entries from people all over the world, you know, everything from, you know, 10 year old kids to, you know, full on design studios putting forward their ideas for how we should paint the Mark II Aurora. And yeah, the result was actually epic. I was blown away by it. I was super stoked to, we got this epic entry from, from Loop Studios in Prague. We had initially thought, you know, we, we need some incentive for people to actually go out and, and do some design work for us. So we had, we thought the prize for that paint, or for winning the paint job would be um, a suborbital payload, you know, fly someone's payload for free. But Loop Studios doesn't actually have too much interest in that. You know, they're not engineers, of course. And so they actually just kindly let us select um, a different payload. And so we found one of the entrants was the Centaurus Physics School in Colorado. And they had an absolutely amazing idea for what they wanted to fly. They wanted to take high altitude measurements. So that's in the mesosphere, it's something like about 60 to 80 kilometers altitude. They want to be able to suck in a little bit of air, you know, where it's super, super thin air, but suck in a little bit of it and measure what pollutants are in it. It's something that we've never done before. Nobody actually knows what's up there in terms of pollutants, but it is a huge part of the atmosphere that transports a lot of mass around and a lot of energy and a lot of pollutants as well. And I, as soon as I read that, I thought this is just such an epic idea. Like, even if these kids don't win, I, I definitely want to fly their payload anyway. You know, this is just something that we should be doing. Yeah. So, no, yeah, this is it just was so cool to be able to give them this, that opportunity. 
this is just good on so many levels, like you said. I mean, A, with the competition, it's, it's effectively space outreach. And I'm, I'm very big on space outreach, which is why I'm doing this. And it, this just allows us to get the message out to more people about space. But then with this payload, this is just like a, a whole other level of goodness too. So well done on that. You quickly referred to the fact that your team, you don't have any graphic designers, you're mostly engineers. And I realized I should have asked you at the beginning. Uh, can you just give us a quick one minute like background of the team, how you guys found each other and how you got into this? Yeah, so, I mean, like the original team, the founders, um, there's four of us founders in the Netherlands studying in Delft University of Technology, and we had been building suborbital rockets, you know, based on pretty big hybrid engines. The, I guess the pinnacle of that was about a one and a half ton thrust engine that we built. It took us about four or so years to, to put it together, and we were the team of about 50 of us put that on a, a rocket that we called Stratus 2, and we took that to Spain and we flew it to about 22 kilometers altitude and it went Mach two and a half. You know, the whole thing was about 200 kilograms at takeoff and it was super amazing project to work on so much fun, but it was like, you know, it was like five years of work for 90 seconds of flight. And while it was cool, it was kind of like, Oh man, like really, that's all you get. There must be a better way of doing this. And I, I had been talking to my brother back in New Zealand and, and walking him through all these projects that I'd been working on. He's about five years older than me. So he'd been working in the aircraft industry for about, 10 or so years at that point, doing all kinds of helicopter modifications and aircraft mods and exporting those designs around the world. And he could see like, you know, the stuff we were working on was cool. It was really high performance. It was quite new technology, but he could also see the horrendously unscalable nature of it. You know, that it was so much work for so little output. And so we kind of put our heads together and realized that there was a better way to do this and that we could marry these two worlds, that we could put something together that had the the operational usability, the scalability of an aircraft and leverage everything in the aircraft world, but still maintain the performance of a rocket. And so he became the fifth founder and the reason that we came back to New Zealand as well to, to utilize that, that really great regulation that we have in New Zealand. I always ask this question because we have a lot of listeners usually who want to get into the space industry. Are you guys hiring in New Zealand and or in Holland? We're definitely hiring. There's a few more job adverts to go out soon for everything from propulsion engineers and systems engineers. And we actually just hired a few more um, electrical engineers and yep, we're building slowly but steadily. Excellent. I'm sure people can find that on, on your website or, or your LinkedIn. So they, they should go there if they're interested. So Stefan, we always finish up these interviews on the same question, which is whether you guys at Dawn Aerospace are into science fiction. And if yes, you know, some of your favorite sci-fi. Now, funnily enough, your colleague, Josh, who is uh, listening to this conversation, he just put into the chat that when we were talking about uh, you guys using the blue Danube vaults to demonstrate the responsiveness of the thrusters, it was actually a reference to 2001, the Space Odyssey. So I guess there's a partial answer there. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but from 2001, any other sort of like sci-fi that's, that's really popular at Dawn Aerospace? Most Stanley Kubrick is pretty good, even outside of just sci-fi stuff. What else is popular here? I actually really quite liked, actually, I guess, real things, like the autobiographies of different space engineers, um, actually even more aircraft, I suppose, the stories that came out of Skunk Works and, and those development programs, the real heyday of space. It's probably, it's not really sci-fi at all. It's stuff that seems sci-fi now, if you think about, you know, they, they developed the U-2 and the SR-71 in a matter of years. Like, how could you possibly develop the world's most capable spy planes in like 18 months from first design to first flight. Like, come on, that's just, that's sci-fi to me. <laughs> I love those stories. It's absolutely incredible what they were able to do. I guess as we alluded to in, in, in many ways, it seems like uh, maybe today with you know some of the guys you guys are doing on the space planes and what SpaceX is doing on the Starship, maybe we're going back to this like glorious uh, period and that that would be fantastic. And I think that's, that's a really optimistic note to close on. Stefan, thank you so much for doing this today. And I wish you guys best of luck. I can't wait to see the Mark II uh, demonstrate a fly. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. That's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting the podcast at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. If you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell, or are interested in being a sponsor, or really anything else, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. That's it. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode. <music>